It was the fall of 2003, and the parents of a nine-year-old girl awoke to find their daughter missing from her bed. She had vanished in the middle of the night. Investigators walked up and down Whitehorde Crescent today, knocking on doors and interviewing neighbors as the search for Cecilia continues. Cecilia Zhang was gone. The house is the crime scene, so again, we have to start back there and move outward, and hopefully somebody saw something that morning, any, any bit of information that we can get. I'm Austin Delaney, and for over 30 years, I have covered crime and the court cases that followed for CTV Toronto. Today, I return to the scene of the crime with CP24's Steve Ryan, who was one of the investigators on the Cecilia Zhang kidnapping and murder case now 18 years ago. Hey, Steve. This, uh, this brings back some memories, doesn't it? It sure does. It sure does. I remember, I remember does. being here the first day, and it was just a missing girl, and we all thought she was going to come home, and she didn't. And, and that is a thought that uh, even seasoned investigators have. And, and, and I think it's a couple of reasons. Number one, it's kind of a coping mechanism, too, I would say, where you are always hopeful that this is not what it appears to be. The, the, the end result is going to be good news. And child abductions are just so rare, especially when somebody breaks into somebody's house in the middle of the night and removes a child and nobody heard a damn thing. That raises some concerns and suspicions as an investigator for sure. The only clue left for police, a cut screen on the second floor window and a knife Ryan found near the home. So all you've really got, Steve, is you've got a screen, it's broken, a knife at the side of the house, Girl's gone, nobody heard anything. Where's your investigation going? Do you have any clues? Not one clue. The house is a 70s style two story that sits on a road a stone's throw south of the Seneca College Finch campus. It is a quiet street populated by families, many of whom rent rooms to international students attending the college. Cecilia's parents had a female student from China living in their basement. You've got two parents in the house when their daughter goes missing and they're like, we heard nothing. They last saw her at 8.30 the night prior on October the 19th. They had dinner together and then there was some piano playing. One of the witnesses in the house heard some piano being played and Cecilia did the play piano at around 9 p.m. And then mom went to get her the next morning for school at about 8.30 and she wasn't uh, in her bed. So where do you go? What do you do? So you start from within and you want to know everything the parents did, everything people associated with the parents did, anybody that visited that place, I would say within the last six or eight months, who was in this house? Who did you talk to outside of this house who knows your living arrangement? That's a big task. Two days after her disappearance, this from the lead investigator. We have no reason to believe at this stage that this is a random attack by a predator. So Steve, when you initially came onto this case, you thought that perhaps it was an inside job that the, that the Zhang family was... Well, two things. Uh, you have to clear the family. They're the first ones you have. As difficult as that is, they are the first people you need to look at, especially in a case where you've got an abduction and middle of the night and nobody hears. There's no screaming from the little girl. There's no noises made. It just seems almost unbelievable. Not to mention most break and enters happen in the daytime when people are home. If you've got somebody break into a house at night when people are home, that's very concerning in and of itself. So the whole thing to me just kind of seemed surreal. And the, parent, the parents had to be cleared as suspects in this little girl's disappearance. So the eyes and the ears of police focused on the house. And that meant surreptitiously planting listening devices inside Cecilia's home. If you're not a cop, this is the stuff you see in movies, when in this case, the police almost get caught by Cecilia's parents, who unexpectedly come home. So what happens is you surveil the house, you wait for the house to be cleared out, and then you get one of these experts to go in and wire up the place, again, with the court's permission. You need grounds to do that. So 
Somebody had to do a, a, a warrant asking the court for permission to go into that house to, to do this based on... And they break in. And they basically have to, to break in to the house. So it's cops breaking into the house, but with a warrant that says you can do that. Right. Right. And that's so we can set up listening devices inside of the house, not necessarily just on their phones, but in the house in general, because they had to be cleared. It's just a bottom line. They, a little girl goes missing in the middle of the night. It doesn't make any sense. It defies logic. Mom and dad had to be cleared as suspects. Now, how smoothly did that go? Well, the guy was almost caught. So the officer was almost caught that, uh, and I say caught, so he was in, and they got to do this work really, really quickly. And, of course, there are people watching. Family was on their way home, and this officer was still in the house. And it was a bit of a, it was a, bit of a panic, but that happens with police work, where things just go from zero to 100 all of a sudden. And he had to get out as quickly as he could, but he had to make sure that everything was working properly before he exited the house. And he did get out just in time before the family came home. Because they're coming down the street, and you're, yell and you're yelling on to him on, on a two-way, I guess it is. Get out, get out. Yeah, they're coming down the street, and we're... Yeah, he's being told that you need to get out there. They are basically approaching the driveway. Even he was able to get out. And they never knew? They never knew. No, never knew. So we continued monitoring uh, them for a, a bit of time. And as I said, there was nothing on, the wire, on those wires, nothing that we heard that even suggested, were, even remotely suggested that they had anything at all to do with uh, their daughter's disappearance. Time moved slowly. As the city hoped and prayed, this little girl would come home. After four agonizing days, Cecilia's father pleaded for his daughter's safe return. As a father, I beg you, I beg you, please look at Cecilia's face. Look at her eyes. What an innocent and lovely girl she is. Believing their daughter could somehow see her parents on TV. Cecilia. You know how much we care about you. You know how much we love you. He's my sweetheart. He loves animals. He loves to read. And uh, she loves fishing, tennis. And she loves to play piano. A hotline was set up, and soon investigators would be flooded with tips. Sightings of Cecilia all over the city, all over the province, all over the country. So we had to track down every one of those tips. That's awfully time-consuming, isn't it? It's um, very time-consuming. It's exhausting, but it is so important because you need to do that as well. It prevents tunnel vision. It prevents focusing on one person. Instead, you do the grand sort of uh, approach where everybody in a, a, a circle who's even suggested as, as maybe being involved, you've got to clear them. Regardless of how absurd you think the tip is, you've got to go clear it. But nothing of any substance was coming up. Detectives were at a loss. We have no suspects at this time in relation to the abduction of Cecilia Jump. October would turn into November, and November would turn into December, but still no sign of Cecilia Zhang. Surely, if they do are, are holding her, they just to treat her, treat her well, and, and try to offer some uh, form of solace at Christmas and, and comfort at this time. Her family desperate for any tips that would lead them to the nine-year-old. A $50,000 reward for information on Cecilia. Posters covered TTC buses and cash boxes across the city. Cecilia's photo was plastered all over the city. Extra officers were out at this year's Santa Claus Parade handing out posters of Cecilia. And still, no solid leads. Just a broken window screen and the knife Ryan found by the side of the house. I found that odd as well because that evidence, to me, was either carelessly discarded or placed there for, for the cops to find. So that concerned me almost immediately. And we had a cut screen with a, leading into the sliding door, and that's how this person got into the house but was it an inside job was it all set up was I supposed to find that knife that's all things that went through my head the first day that I walked around this place a random kidnapping was not making any sense so Ryan and the investigative team turned to Cecilia's mother and brought her in for questioning your job was to take Cecilia's mom into the interrogation room 
and talk to her. Yeah, so that happened at the end of the investigation with regards to the parents. So we were investigating this with tips coming in, and again, we had to clear the parents. So I was assigned with basically interrogating mom and accusing her of killing her own uh, daughter. Ha had to be done. And oftentimes with killers, if you don't ask, they don't tell. It was pretty tough, wasn't it? Like you, you really, you, you explained it to me, you really had to go at it hard. It was very difficult. As a matter of fact, I, I often wondered if I saw uh, that woman today, I kind of feel compelled to apologize. I and mean, I was doing my job, of course, but now looking back on it, yeah, I went at her pretty hard, but I would say the last 40 minutes of that interview. I, I'll tell you a quick uh, example of what happened. During the interrogation, it was done downtown, and I had, uh, my boss was watching, there was a few other senior detectives watching my interrogation. And the mom got really quiet all of a sudden, and I thought I had her. I thought, this is it, this is the moment. So I bring my chair, rolling, the chairs are rolling, and they're always that way, because if you're interrogating somebody, you want to move in and move out of their personal space. So I moved in with her, really close, and I lowered my voice, and I said, it's okay. I know you did it, time is up, now you can tell me, help me understand why you did it. And there was silence, she had her head down for the longest time, and I'm nose to nose with her, and then she leaps out of her chair, right in my face and screams, I didn't do this. And it, I was taken aback by just how loud she screamed in my face. Um, she was pretty convincing. When that interview was over, I was pretty convinced that she had uh, nothing to do with this. So we were able to move on from clearing the parents based on the wiretap, there was nothing. There's no evidence that suggests they had anything to do with it. Mom's denial after the lengthy interrogation I had with her, dad was interrogated as well. And uh, it was an abduction. Ryan now walks along the sidewalk up to the house which was the crime scene so long ago. The former detective has fallen out of touch with the family and wants to know if they still live in the home. Hi there, I'm looking for Miss Zhang. She, do they still live here, the parents? So I was a detective that you, I investigated Cecilia's case when she went missing. But Cecilia's parents have relocated long ago. It's now been 64 days since Cecilia Zhang vanished. With the parents now cleared, the investigators had little to offer. And with the passing of time and no ransom demand, the chances the nine-year-old being returned safely were becoming slim. Down the street from her home, her grade four classmates at Seneca Hill Public School worried she was being mistreated. I don't really know what happened to her and I'm not sure. And just that I feel really unhappy. What do you think about when you think about her, where, where she is? I think that they might not be feeding her and she might be starving and she might, she might come home alive but really hungry. Five months would pass with no sign of Cecilia Zhang and no suspects, no ransom demands, just two hang-ups on the phone line in the house the morning Cecilia disappeared. Those phones were traced to two pay phones, one in Brampton and one in Mississauga. I was sent uh, by my detective sergeant to go out and investigate uh, one of those two pay phones. We got surveillance, printed the pay phones, and uh, there was nothing on that that uh, helped us. So you stayed on that phone for quite some time in case the, the kidnapper came back? We did, we did. And we had the, uh, the uh, uh, phone booths fingerprinted and we surveilled them for a while as well to see if anybody would come back, but there was, there was nothing to it. The payphone hang-ups did indicate there might be a ransom demand for Cecilia, so investigators waited. The officer in charge at the time had uh, an officer stay in the house with the family 24 hours, just in case that call came back. You wanted some direction as to what to say and what not to say on the phone, but the, the call never came. And that's because she was dead. And that's because she was dead. In March the following spring, Cecilia's remains would be found by a jogger running along a path at the edge of the Credit River. It is our next stop. We drive about 45 kilometers on the highway across the city of Toronto to Mississauga and park at the rear of the Croatian Martyrs Roman Catholic Church. 
Steve, you're just off Mississauga Road here, right? It's a busy street, and then you get behind this church, and it's a private park. Yeah, this is a uh, private park that leads down into uh, a creek, and there's a lot of joggers and uh, dog walkers on this path. And it's not a surprise uh, that uh, Cecilia's remains were found in an area like this, because oftentimes that's what that's what it's done. The, the suspects often bring remains to an area that's uh, heavily uh, wooded, um, thinking that maybe the animals will, will, will get the remains, or they try to bury them, but they always surface because animals do get at them, and they will dig them up, or an animal will be attracted to whatever is, is left. Or in this particular case, you've just got somebody walking by who's a, a, a jogger and happens to come across what the, they believed were, were remains of some sort. Okay, let's go to the spot. Sure. I push on the metal gate. There is an opening to the path to the park, surrounded by a 10-foot chain-link fence. It is a heavily wooded area. The brush is thick, the air damp after morning rain showers. So you can see how isolated this is. So it would be, the you'd think, if you were unsophisticated and you know, homicide and, and, and get disposing of evidence, you'd think that this would be the perfect place to do it. But it actually isn't. There really isn't a perfect spot, is there? You're absolutely right. There's, there's always somebody somewhere, and there's animals everywhere. And oftentimes, quite often, um, it could be years later, remains do surface because they are dug up by animals or just people in general with high traffic areas. The slope down to the park from the church parking lot is steep. The stairs are just pieces of wood placed about a foot apart. They are greasy from the rain. Careful, these are slippery. A crude wooden handrail to the left for balance. It is hard not to think of Cecilia's killer making his way down the path in the darkness of the night. You kind of got a picture, Shen, holding her. And she's dead, right? And yeah. Coming, coming down these slippery stairs. Yeah, that's, that, that's an image that uh, I've had for an awful long time when, when we learned as to where her remains were left, was him coming down this area here. You know, did he take this pathway and did he have her a nine-year-old child in his arms as he's bringing her down here. It's a, it's a disturbing thought, but it is one that, that, that has stayed with me for a long time. But as you break out here, you, you go right into the open of this park. It's, yeah, it's, yeah, it's a beautiful park, but it's, it's private. The park's lawn is lush. There are picnic tables in the open air, a children's playground, and a pool. On this day that we visit, there is no one around but the groundskeeper. We continue walking across the grass, crossing the path to the edge where the Credit River runs through. Whereabouts was she, do you know? So the way it was described to me, she was in this particular area near the water. And there was a jogger that was uh, coming by and he found, uh, he found the remains. And uh, that person was the one that called, called the police. She has been in the brush for five months. There is little left after a harsh winter. So when, they're, when they first find these, these remains, they don't even know if it's human. Yeah, that's right. The remains are found, and it's usually bone that uh, people find, and oftentimes they're animal remains. So what happens in a situation where you find remains and you can't tell whether they're human remains or not, you obviously just seal off that area. You don't touch anything. You have a coroner come. You may have an uh, anthropologist come. They look at the, at the bones and are able to tell that they are in fact the human remains, now you have to identify them. And we had uh, Cecilia's uh, dental records from the time that she went missing, so Peel Region were able to use her dental records and compare those with the remains at the scene here, and that's how they're able to make a, a positive identification. I gather the first notion that there, it's a human remains, it's a, it's a young girl, a nine-year-old, a young girl, you go straight away to who's missing, and that's Cecilia. Yeah, that's right. So that would have been one of the first things done was to compare the remains that were found with any outstanding uh, missing people that we knew of. And the only one we knew of at the time was uh, Cecilia. So it w didn't take long to kind of put those two things together. Now at least part of the Cecilia Zhang mystery is solved. Unfortunately, though, not the way her family, the city, and the investigators who had tirelessly searched for her had hoped. I imagine it was crushing for you as investigators because you thought, hoped anyway, that Cecilia was still alive. 
you always hope. You now, as time passes, the, the, the more concerned you become. But it was a ransom investigation, so you do always hope that the, the person is being, the person being held, in this case, a little nine-year-old, is being treated well by, by, by somebody, and, they, and there was a plan in place where they just wanted money, and they were going to come up with an exchange location, exchange the little girl for the money, and then we would pursue them afterwards. But in uh, this case, yeah, that wasn't the situation. It was very, very, uh, it was very uh, sad when we learned the news, and then the reality hit that, you know, there's a child murderer out there somewhere, and another little kid uh, dead because of it. Now it was on to find the child's killer, who, like most murderers, had left crucial identifying evidence at the scene. In this case, fingerprints and DNA. But because Cecilia's remains were found in Mississauga, Peel's homicide squad took over the investigation. They were able to learn that uh, Min Shen was a international student that visited Cecilia's house because he had a friend that lived in the basement. She was also an international student. And he visited them around six times. So Peel were able to interview him and he gave them a consent, a DNA sample and fingerprints as well. If he had not given DNA and fingerprints, investigators would have gone another route, like in the Holly Jones murder, where Michael Briere refused to give a DNA sample to investigators. Police followed Briere and picked up his discarded pop can, finding his DNA on the lip, leading to an arrest and conviction for the 10-year-old girl's sexual assault and murder. Interestingly enough, most people if they are suspects in a homicide and they're asked to provide a consensual DNA sample or give their fingerprints, most are going to say no. That draws a lot of attention to them. In some cases, in this one and in the Paul Bernardo case as well, it reminds me of that because he gave a consensual DNA sample. Sometimes you get these guys where they feel like they're backed into a corner and they don't know what to do. So they'll give the sample and worry about step two next time. Mm -hmm. And this guy, I'm sure, thought that because her remains were out here in the elements for so long, there was no way in hell there was going to be any evidence on her body. And I'm sure he didn't know about uh, dental records and all that sort of, sort of forensic um, techniques for identifying uh, remains. So I'm sure he didn't think twice about it. I'm sure he thought he was scot-free the whole time. So when Peel asked him for DNA and for fingerprints, he gave it up. He probably thought for quite some time he was getting away with murder. He thought he was getting away with murder, and I'm sure as he gave those samples, he thought the same thing because her remains were out here for as long as they were. And also with Bernardo, he gave sample, but it sat on the shelf for years. That's right. That's right. So these guys don't know how long it's going to take before they're actually caught, but oftentimes, and we get this through training as well, when they talk about approaching people to um, get samples from, because they refuse doesn't mean they are the suspect and because they give it doesn't mean they aren't the suspect. Each situation is different but if somebody is backed into a corner it's not the first time that a, uh, a homicide suspect has provided evidence against themselves consensually because they're worried about the next step tomorrow. Let me just get through today first and that's what they do. Three years later Min Chen, his father an airline executive in Shanghai, his mother a police officer in that same city pleaded guilty to second-degree murder and was sentenced to life in prison for the kidnapping and murder of Cecilia Zhang. According to an agreed statement of fact, Chen admitted breaking into the North York home and taking Cecilia, covering her face and placing her in the trunk of his car. When he checked on her a short time later, she was already dead, saying he did not mean to kill the nine-year-old girl. Ryan is skeptical. I think that was very self-serving on his part. It really doesn't explain much. I think it helps him, who well, he thinks it helps. He thought it would help him because there really is no suffering at that point. She's dead almost immediately. So he has to come up with, there's no explanation. He doesn't have to come up with an explanation as to where he, what he did with her. Did he sexually assault her? Did he abuse her? That was never learned because her, her remains were so badly decomposed. We only learned of her cause of death um, when he said he smothered her. But was she sexually assaulted? Was she harmed, abused, tortured? We would never know because uh, her remains were, were, were too bad to examine by a pathologist to determine what else happened to her. Chen says he did it for money. The international student was flunking out at college, running out of his parents' cash, and facing deportation back to China. He told police he needed $25,000 to pay for a marriage of convenience in order to stay in Canada. If Chen is ever paroled from a Canadian prison, 
he will be deported and face trial again in China. I'm Austin Delaney.